Ahi ahi māori e. Um, afternoon, everybody. So we have uh, a panel for the final session this afternoon and um, a good chance to bring together a lot of the threads that have come up during the day today. So can I ask our panellists to come up on stage, please? Hi, <laughs> mai. <laughs> and do we have the microphone? Can you hear me? Yep. Uh, so we have a very diverse panel here and um, the plan is to uh, say zoom in and zoom out a bit um, in terms of the geographic spread that we have uh, and the sort of breadth of knowledge. So what I'm going to ask the panellists to do is to firstly um, introduce themselves and then our first uh, question that we're going to talk about a little bit is the um, matauranga. Um, in, the, in the broader sense of indigenous knowledge and thinking about it across, um, as I think you me mentioned, Kenny Duke, about sort of international sense of indigenous knowledge and how that uh, can uh, come into influence in terms of landscape architecture. But also the, the challenge of not always sharing everything. Some things are not for sharing and some things are. So I think this is a, a topic that uh, might be a useful thing to, to explore a little this afternoon. This is your one, Bunny. You want to do yourself? Um, if you each introduce yourselves, I think, as we oh. come through, if that would be okay. Yeah. Kia ora. Sorry, Kenny Duke. Yeah, I just had a little chat from Nati Manya Poto. Sawadika. I'm Kochakon from Thailand, landscape architect. Yes. Uh, kia ora koto, ko tamatama arangi waiting, uh, toku ingoa. Uh, toku ingoa. Uh, ko te whanau a uh, panui uh, toku iwi. I'm a designer at Scape. Uh, kia ora. Oh, kia ora no koutou. Uh, ko Anika Young toku ingoa. He uri e hau o Ngāti Rārua me Tia Tiawa. Um, yeah, kaitiaki in the rohi. Kia ora no koutou. Uh, ko Rowena Kadbi toku ingoa. He uri um, no Tia Tiawa, Ngāti Tama and kwa mahi at te runanga o Ngāti Rārua. Kia ora. Uh, kia ora tātou, Barney Thomas. Uh, born in Picton, born in Te who will die here and get buried here. And um, I promised my wife I'd get off a few committees, and it's not working. <laughs> oh, in relation to Mātauranga? Uh, actually, it's an interesting topic, Mātauranga, and especially around what are the constraining issues uh, that we have in relation to Mātauranga. And I think the constraining issues that we have are the old legislation that we have here in New Zealand. And the old legislation uh, doesn't acknowledge or provide for... Uh, so, you know, when, we, when we're talking about entities uh, such as councils and government departments, their policies are normally aligned to their legislation. And when, when we have uh, that older legislation, the policies don't actually acknowledge or provide for uh, the use of mā tauranga. Uh, and then when push comes to shove, uh, everyone that is a decision maker will go back to whatever their legislation is and how is it interpreted. So it's actually, it's about where does the L-O-R-E fit with the L-A-W, the legislation? And is, uh, uh, are people that are interpreting uh, the legislation, the L-A-W, brave enough and open-minded enough to provide for that space? Uh, and, you know, I, I find that uh, when, we're in that uh, we're in, when we're in that situation, um, it's when uh, things uh, get a bit heated or 
probably not aligned with uh, the legislation is uh, uh, the ma tauranga. And, that, and I think that's one of the reasons why uh, sometimes we don't share all that ma tauranga, that knowledge. Um, you know, there's the old pūrāko, the old story, like I told this morning, um, but uh, I didn't tell you all of it. Uh, and so I, I'll give you a little bit of a nibble, uh, but I'm not going to give you the whole, the whole, whole hook and bait. So kia ora. Um, kia ora. Um, yeah, I was just thinking further to what Barney said that it's also a bit of a mind bender how do you incorporate Mātauranga into the Western planning science framework. So, for example, with Tumano Tawai project, how do we how do we translate the Tumano Tawai statements into things like the national objectives framework into limits and attributes? Yeah, so um, lots of challenges all around, really. Uh, it's be it, it really does test my brain. It's better than doing crosswords for warding off old age. So, yeah, <laughs> a few challenges. Yeah, kia ora koutou. Um, I think just in terms of mā tauranga Māori here in Aotearoa, um, there's a really deep um, knowledge-based system that has been used now in, you know, in the, the research development space for a while because of a vision Mā Tauranga, but Mā Tauranga Māori is associated to um, Mā Tauranga Māori practitioners or knowledge holders. And so it's about who are those knowledge holders. It's the, um, the kaumātua, or it's the hapu, or it's the whānau within those areas. So it's not something you can sort of use in, as a transaction or integrate into something to make it something else. It belongs in a certain space. And so there's a level of understanding of um, you know, who, where it should sit and how it should be realised when we're talking about these types of planning situations. So, for example, um, the whakapapa of water. You know, there's a real deep knowledge about that that not all of us actually know what that is as Māori. There's certain people who, within our communities, that hold that whakapapa or knowledge. So... Is it about the relationship with the people or is it that we're creating safe spaces to allow those people to move in and protecting that? But just in terms of some of the areas that I work in, um, particularly Western science and vision ma and Mātauranga Māori with the vision Mātauranga policy, um, we've seen it being used and misused and exploited for other people's um, purposes. And so for iwi, it's about um, protecting it for themselves. But there's also been a massive loss of knowledge over the years as a result of colonisation. So it's reconnecting our whānau back to those areas to tie our to that knowledge as well as how can we, um, I guess, use that knowledge as Indigenous people to better and empower ourselves. So, yeah, kia ora. Kia ora. Uh... I guess just to add to that, it's kind of like everyone's on their own journey uh, and you can't assume that just because you're Māori that they have all the answers. So I guess being somewhat young, not too young anymore, but uh, <laughs> you find that some firms put a lot of pressure on, uh, you know, Māori youth to kind of, kind of come up with the answers and to kind of hold that knowledge, which in their, their own respect, they're kind of on their own journey to discover themselves. So, yeah, go on. Um, let me put in a tight context about the knowledge and how we want to share or not sharing. And I just feel that even in the history, we've been said that, yeah, we're not being a colonized nation. But of course, we lose some part of the Burma, we lose some part of Malaysia, we lose some part of Cambodia that used to be tied to many other countries. So I just feel that put it into the present context that we still don't want and anyone don't want to be colonize and I just feel that going through all this global stage to being the top down and then the bottom up I just feel that I'm afraid that climate change will be another instrument to colonize us with technology with solution you have to be resilient you know like all this terminology so something that I don't want to share is my land to those solutions that is not fit to us. Yeah, kia ora. <clears throat> Just sort of summing up what Barney and <clears throat> Anika were going on about. Um, I think preserving cultural knowledge is important 
in this context because it, it helps inform uh, urban design practices and it creates a more sustainable and culturally appropriate, appropriate urban environment. So that's how it's, you know, it can affect you directly. And Indigenous people have a unique knowledge, or mātauranga, <coughs> we call it you know, knowledge, about the environment, land, management practices, and in some cases, um, community building. So that can be valuable in designing our um, urban spaces that are respectful of the environment and promote sort of social cohesion. Actually, um, about 10 years ago, we, we hosted some traditional owners from Australia and we took them up the Abel Tasman. Some of these people from the, uh, from, from the traditional owners in Australia had never seen the sea before. Uh, and so we take them up the Abel Tasman and we get up to a place um, up by uh, Frenchman's Bay um, and there's a little, little cove in there that's called Burial Bay. And... Uh, there was an old lady, uh, an old kui kui from uh, the traditional owners, and she came and sat next to me on the boat. And she said to me, as we, as we went past this bay, dead people. And I thought, hmm, that's matakete. The matakete is, they are really powerful people. They are powerful people because they can see things that we can't. You know, we're just normal, normal people. And... and that lady, she'd never been to New Zealand, never seen the sea before, but as we were going past on that boat, she pointed out that bay and she said dead people and that bay was called Burial Bay. And so the, the mātauranga, the, the knowledge sharing between indigenous uh, cultures is very, very similar. Thank you for that um, response to that first um, little kind of prompt there. Um, we're going to move on now and also just want to flag it up to everybody out there in the audience that we're going to take some questions from the audience later. So please um, have some questions ready for us, things that you might have been burning to ask all day or something that you would like to find out. And similarly amongst the panel, if there's things you would like to ask one another as well. Uh, second... Um, sort of point that we were going to talk about is kaitiakitanga and for landscape architects, you know, this uh, ethos of care and of stewardship is pretty fundamental to our profession. And I think even from memory you might have been in one of the, the earlier sort of documents for Tuia Pito Ora back in the, the early days of the Institute um, that stewardship is very much kind of core to what we do. Um, and of course in Aotearoa this, the concept of kaitiakitanga, of, of care for um, people of land and so on, uh, is something that uh, maybe we take for granted in some ways. So uh, another uh, yeah, useful thing to explore a little bit um, amongst the panel. So over to you guys. <laughs> me first. Um, <clears throat> for me, kaitiakitanga is pretty, pretty simple. Chop those trees down from over there and, and build your building with that. Try, not, try to get your local trade people to do all the work. It's not rocket science. For me, it's about waste minimization too, which is one of the primary things from an architectural perspective. We're just trying to reduce waste. 90%, I think, of our landfills at the moment are construction wastes. So we've got to, you know, we've got to deal with that. Don't import those triple glazed windows from Germany because although they're nice and they're thermally broken and got all the bells and whistles, they come from Germany. So kaitiakitanga, to me, is that whole cyclical thing. Where, where is it coming from? Where is it even the labour coming from? Um, so keep it simple. It's that old saying, I think, and, um, and you can't go too far wrong. Um, and I agree, yes. There is some points that uh, my people, my land, like in Bangkok, we used to live with water, right? And when it's come Bangkok as the concept of big city, which is only like, what, 100, 100 or 200 years city, and comparing to many other cities around the world, we are a new city. And I just feel that. But right now, no one want to move because we are going our paint. We keep doing <laughs> things over and over again. And I just feel that there's some point that we have that balance, but we're not naive and we couldn't return to that point. 
but how can we find a new um, future that going towards that concept by having what by having pains that we have but reduce it or learn from it and I think that is so important of because right now all the nature term has become nature-based solution resilience adaptation and it's mimicking the nature but every project going back and see objective still the same engineers still want to protect whatever the embankment the water to channel all this um, barging and many other things so i just feel that it's such a very important and very tricky moment that we are now using nature again to serve us. Yes. Uh, I guess also to add to that, um, as Katia Kitanga is also about uh, building kind of social resilience, so thinking about how we are, like the social environment, right? Like what are we setting up in terms of foundations as landscape architects? How are people operating the landscape, how are they working the landscape, uh, and is it going to be thriving and perpetuated into the future, so. Yeah, well, kia ora. Um, Kaitiakitanga is, um, for me, is, it's a kupu that's been thrown around for a long, long time, but it has a really simple um, understanding, for myself anyway, which is, you know, Kai is a person, and a tiaki is someone who cares for something, so. I think the understanding of it has been used a lot in the environmental space and in the RMA space, and it's probably been a bit of a buzzword, actually, but when you go back to what it really means, it's about someone caring for something. So that could be anything. Um, but in the Taiao space, it's um, Kaitiaki sits with the, the mana whenua iwi. Um, it's a Māori kupu, and that's where it should sit. Um, and it's our intergenerational responsibility to the whenua and to our, our future generations. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, we, we use it a lot, but I think it's really un having an understanding of the essence of what, what that word means and where it's used. So, you know, legislation, it's taken out of context. So I think, um, like all the tangas, you know, everyone uses the tangas, it's kind of like, well, how do we interpret what that means and, and what should, you know, wh where should that kupu sit? So um, for us, it's taking those words back um, from the tanifa, from the crown, and using them in a safer space for our, um, for our people. Um, but for me, yeah, I mean, it's a lot of work. That's what Kaitiaki Tanga is. It's, um, it's standing up in the hearings. It's, um, you know, going down and planting trees. It's ensuring our... Rangatahi, understand the tikanga on the marae, it's a whole range of things. So for you as planners and designers, it's understanding you know, what that means to Māori first, and then what does it mean when you interpret it within your work. Um, yeah, but I, I won't rave on. Oh, also, just one last thing. <laughs> one, um, you can't have kaitiaki tanga without tino rangatira tanga. Um, so, you know, we've had a major loss of land in this country as, as Māori, as Indigenous people. So if we don't have control or tinoranga tiratanga or authority to make decisions over those wai, moana, whenua, then we, we can't be kaitiaki. So there's, you know, those two um, concepts are, are interlink with each other. Um, and so that's what we're talking about when we say we want to sit at the table, we want to be part, part of the planning and decision making because then we can be effective kaitiaki, yeah. Kia ora. I don't think I can add to the eloquence of Anita's explanation, except I just will say that um, yeah, in the work that, that I do for the runanga, it's, it's, it, it's, it's hard and it's um, noisy and it's, uh, there's a lot of demands, but it sits really well in my puku because I, I also really do believe that what what we're asking for in terms of kaitiakitanga is good for everybody. And I think that's something that landscape architects that I've worked with very much understand too. So it just makes it an easier space to talk in. Kia ora. Uh, kia ora. Um, look, I think uh, kaitiaki are the people. Kaitiakitanga is how we do the, do the mahi. But uh, the, for me, you need to know your rohe. If you're going to be kaitiaki, 
So if I went to Taupo or Turangi, I'd be way out of my depth because I don't know the rohe, I don't know which way the, the rivers flow, I don't know the names, I don't know the budako. But I feel at home here because I know my rohe. And so if you're going to be kaitiaki, you need to be able to know your rohe uh, and, and how it operates. And we have a big pahuta kawa tree sitting outside our tea room and every year we can tell whether the season's ahead or behind, depending on when that when that rako flowers. And so I heard someone talking about maramataka, and for us it's understanding uh, that world. And you know, just over the last five, ten years, we've had matariki, matariki introduced. And so it's understanding those worlds or that world to ensure that the the knowledge. Uh, uh, is handed down, but it's all about knowing your rohe and uh, protecting it for the next generation. Kia ora koutou. Um, does anyone in the audience have any questions for our panellists? and thank you to uh, all the panellists. Uh, my name's Malene Absalom and I'm from Tai Tokoro. Um, Kenny has mentioned a couple of times in his talk to us the um, chopping down of the pine trees and using them locally, which caused me to um, think about, as I flew into Nelson yesterday, I was reminded just how many pine trees there are around your city. Um, which I have an opinion about, but I'd be interested to hear your opinions about. But I was also wondering whether the um, recent rain events had caused you any problems, as has occurred elsewhere, because of that particular land use, and whether you see that as a pr problem in the future. Well, if you look at um, over the certain time of the year, the pollen that comes off those trees, and you know, I'm forever washing my car because I'm pedantic about having a clean car inside and out, uh, and I'm forever washing it. But imagine that pollen <coughs> that comes in, and what effect does it have on our waterways? What effect does it have on our, our moana out here? Uh, and so um, we, we have a 25 hectare block um, of land that we, we own in one of the entities that I'm a director on and we've just harvested all the all the the blue gum and the pine trees off there and so the decision that we made was our koha our our gift to the our next generation is that we're not going to replant in pine trees we're going to replant in native uh, and um, and so we've we, we've put together the, the rongoa trees because uh, our, our next generation, rather than going and applying to someone else, uh, we will have those trees available uh, for uh, those purposes. Yeah, <clears throat> if I can add to that. Um, thanks for that question. That's a really good question. No, I'm not a fan of pine trees, actually, is the short answer to that. And the reason is because back home in the king country, everybody's planting out pine now to grab those carbon credits, right? And it's destroying our community. It used to be farm farmland, you know, good arable farmland. Now it's getting sucked up with these pine trees that get locked. The farms get locked up too with those pine trees. Once they're in there, that's it. You don't get them back. You can't harvest them after a period of time. So the land's locked up. So no, I'm not strictly a fan of them. I'm sort of talking more from a building materials um, perspective where just lo use local materials wherever you can. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing... I'm not a fan of is yes, and an answer to your question, did it do damage? It did a lot of damage, because these bloody pine trees that are up in the thing, when it rains hard and you have a bad storm, all of that sludge comes down into our awa, and then it goes straight out to sea. And so I think there needs to be a defensible space at the bottom of all forestry blocks. It's my own personal thing. Some people might get brassed off with me saying that, but there needs to be like a 100-metre strip at the bottom of all those blocks, especially on those steeper blocks, 
where there might be, I don't know, a defensible space of native tree plantings that they forestry block, uh, groups have to plant. So it protects our awa from all of that runoff because it's terrible. Like when you went to Tahuna Beach in Rabbit Island, it was full of bark and you know it's from the forestry operations and it just happened that up the road here in the, um, up in the Mai Tai they had felled a lot of those blocks and then we had that massive September storm and yeah, a lot of damage. <clears throat> so that's something that needs to be seriously addressed, I reckon. Yeah, and just to add to that, um, here in Te Tauriha, a lot of the Iwi, when they set, settled, they, as part of the redress, they got um, forestry lands back. So we've actually inherited this problem of, of forestry. And so there is a lot of thinking, like Barney said, around diversifying out of those land use practices. Um, but it, it's, it's a tricky one because you've got land managers. We're the owner of the land. You've got the land managers who are often sort of Chinese or somewhere else. Um, and then, you know, where do the trees go after that? So it's, um, it's a complex political issue, but it's definitely front of mind, I think, for EWI leaders around what, you know, their responsibility. Um, and I know councils are also thinking about um, retiring some of their forestry lands um, here in, in the region. But, yeah, as Kenny said, our Tasman Bay is um, that's loaded up with sediment and sludge you know, the whole Benthic um, community has been pretty much wiped out because of forestry. So I think it's about the community, um, all those stakeholders and iwi and council um, taking a big leap of faith and actually um, making some hard decisions about what's happening because it's impacting, you know, the, the, the morn is the bottom of the line. Um, so, yeah, we need to do something about that. I don't actually have anything to add on Nelson because I'm not from Whakatū, so... Actually, this region used to be one of the, the best regions for scallops. And I think around about 10 to 12 years ago, everyone, you know, all the iwi were into scallops. There is not enough uh, uh, biomass out there. Uh, the scallops are not, uh, are not uh, maturing, and so the industry is no longer... And I put that down to everything that is being poured into that. You know, when those of you are from the North Island, that little island over there, <coughs> when, you, when you fly into Nelson, it looks quite beautiful, doesn't it? Well, actually, it's nothing but a toilet. If we're honest with ourselves, nothing's growing in there. Everything's being dumped into there. And the, the runoff from those forests are going into there. And so, you know, we've got all our sewage going into there. We've got everything that, that comes off the land is going into there. And uh, we tend to be taking and taking and taking and not giving anything back. Um, kia ora and sawadee kap. Um, Thank you very much. It's amazing to have such a group of people in front of us with the, with the expertise that you have. It's a really interesting when we talk about mātauranga and protecting the people and protecting the knowledge. But in front of us, we all have a huge challenge with climate change and sea level rise. And I just wonder how mana whenua, the community, thinks about the resource that they will need to provide to help us, to help us all um, with that challenge? So uh, one of the entities I'm on as a director is Wakatu Incorporation. We have a 500-year plan. And the 500-year plan is around our principles and our values. And, um, you know, we, I mean, we're, we're, we're into seafood, we're into wine, you might taste some of it tonight. Um, we're into wine, we're into orchards. Um, and so what we're saying, we're challenging our managers to reduce uh, the sprays, to look at uh, ensuring that we look after our lands uh, and that um, in relation to uh, Kiutaki Tai, um, you know, we, we get different pockets of... of uh, entities coming to us saying, uh, look, we need to talk to you about biodiversity. And then we, we, then we get others that come and say, well, we need to talk to you about water. And then 
uh, and then the Moana. And our thinking is, actually, don't come to us one at a time. Come to us together, because they're all interrelated. Uh, and I think it's taken years for people to understand that. Um, and, uh, and especially our science fraternity, um, understanding the fact that um, uh, they're all interrelated and if, if something's out of kilter, they're all going to get out of kilter. And so we need to treat them all the same with respect and ensure that we're not damaging them and giving something back to them. Yeah, I don't know if anyone saw that David Attenborough uh, thing on Netflix. But it's the first time I actually truly understood what he's been going on about for decades now. It's the balance of the whole planet, right? He talks about the desert winds in, in North Africa that affect the monsoons in India, that affect the fish that are cruising around in the Pacific, in the South, um, in the South Pacific. It's it's all what I realised what what he was saying was it's all interconnected, the whole thing. And Maori have had that perception of, of Tatao and our connection to it forever. So it's it's not nothing new, but the way I deal with that, this is me personally, is by returning that farm to wetland, is by looking at regenerative farming practices on our farm, is by reducing the carbon footprint in the buildings that I'm designing. Like, you know, I only found out when I first started art in architecture, concrete's made from cement, cement is made from coal. So you got to burn coal to make cement. So it's like, okay, well, how do I dodge that? Well, just try and do timber floors or something. So that's the way I address the whole climate change issue is by taking care of my own little patch and what I have control of. And if we're all doing that, it has a massive impact. And you can see that from our um, areas that we lock off for fishing right? It bounces back really quickly. That, that place out in Cable Bay here, when they locked that up, I went diving there the following year and all the coda were back and all the blue cob were swimming around again. So it doesn't take much for it to bounce back. And I think if we all do our little bit, and that's why I was saying early on, I challenge you guys because you're in that spot, you've got to push it and push everybody and, and make sure that you're doing the best you can to address those things because it's super important. Um, a good question. I think I answered it by talking about climate change. <laughs> so anyway. Um, I think sea level rise is, is real, of course. And I think some of us in this planet have to go. Like, we have to adapt. And we have to learn. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> my city is sinking. And I just feel that there's some things that we have done and we already create pains and you cannot just get rid of pain by not understand it or fix it or going to the doctor or something, right? So I'm sure that millions of people will have to move and when it's hit to 1.5 degrees, the ice will melt from Nepal and down and people have to move because there's no fresh water. So I think Reality is there, but I just feel that what we can learn is about mindset. I think this is so important that you can have high technologies and many things to keep you where you are, but the mindset is so important. Like, Bangkok people have to learn to be amphibious again. It's, it's, it's doable because it's in our genes, but we have to activate that as fast as possible and finding the solution with posit positivity. Because otherwise, we just sit and wait. We can't. But yes, mindset. Hi, uh, kia ora. Climate change is a, um, it's definitely a big social um, issue. Um, I think that, um, yeah, just... Uh, it's, it takes, it's going to take transformation of change. And, you know, Barney talked about, a, like, tohu and indicators of a Hutakawa tree. We're seeing a range of um, major environmental collapses around our rohi. Um, you know, one of them, just recently, I was in Kaikoura um, talking to Nati Kuri around the Hutton she water, which is a... Um, a, a, a species of bird that's only, you know, it's, it's only found in, in that particular area. 
and every year it, it flies off to um, Australia. Don't know what it does, but it comes back. And um, and the issue that that it's been having is with with the sea level temperatures rising, their food has kind of dropped down in the water column, and they can't reach their food. And so they're making these big um, migrations to Australia, but they're not coming back. And to us, that's a you know that's a tohu, that's an indicator of of major changes and shifts shifts in the environment. Um, and there's plenty more of those around. Um, just not been able to um, harvest kai is, is one of those things. And Barney talked about our ability to to harvest kai out of the mourners. It's non-existent in this in this rohi. So I think um, it's a social problem and it's a social challenge. And for mana whenua, um, we do have, we're engaging with a range of people around climate change. We're sort of grappling with our own what does it mean to us in terms of climate change, and it will be about retreat, where we look, which areas are we going to be looking for for retreat when that sea level rise happens, um, looking after our people, um, and then, you know, um, looking after the planet. So, um, yeah, I think there's um, a lot going on in that, that department, but it's not just environment, it's also, you know, it's a, it's a community issue. Um, our iwi are part of civil defence um, work here, so we have a a table at the emergency centre when we do have responses to environmental um, events. And that's really big and new, but that's been really important in terms of how we're responding to our people, but to the community as well. So using marae as places of refuge. Um, yeah, but I think just touching on what um, Kenny said around um, indigenous thinking and philosophies, of returning back to things that are simple, back to the, to Taiao. Um, once we can restore the balance of what's been happening, um, then I think we'll start to see our Taiao kind of chilling out a bit. But at the moment, it's um, you know we're having extreme events a lot, and it's it's quite um, scary. But the Taiao is telling us what's going on out there. So it's about listening, listening to um, Papa Tuanuku and and Ranginui. Yeah, kia ora. Yeah, I guess it's also, I guess it's also about looking back, right? If we look at our indigenous people, they've already known where the push and pulls of nature occur. Um, settlements, you know, they migrated over certain seasons to move to higher ground or to be closer to like fisheries and stuff like that. So, learning to like work with the landscape, um, kind of reintroducing that social re resiliency again, you know, um, switching mindsets, behaviors. Um, the way in which we operate the landscape or work it. Um, so, yeah, I guess that could link into uh, all sorts of things. You know, mana whenua have a lot of knowledge surrounding uh, marine life, uh, plant species, um, traditional practices, and how you can, um, you know, work with the landscape rather than against it. Um, it's all well and great creating breakwaters to reduce wave action, but if there's no community to, um, <laughs> to, to, to protect because they have, um, they have no skills in place to kind of, you know, take refuge or, or build in that kind of living with the water or having your house every now and then inundated with water, um, then, you know, you're just going to create communities that, that really struggle and um, are going to continue to fight, um, fight against it. So... Uh, I, guess, I guess it's, yeah, you guys all know your landscape architects. It's about working with nature rather than against that. And the best way to do it is kind of look back. And who lived here before? Indigenous people, you know? And it's the world round. Um, it's a little different uh, in New Zealand because of, like, obviously the way in which we were colonized or, um, you know, different legislation in place. Um, very different dynamic in the States. Um, we have a lot to learn from people here in Aotearoa, so if you're not working with mana whenua or have any of the tongas in your um, design packs, then you need to get on the walker because the, the ship's about to sail. Um, but yeah, kia ora. Any more questions? We're, we're getting down towards the end of our time, so I might just wrap up by asking our panel if they um, have one more parting shot for us 
a takeaway message of something that you uh, really wanted to say today or you'd like to leave everybody with as we wander off into the afternoon today, something, a bit of food for thought to finish with. Uh, look, I, just, um, I think we need to learn to listen. I've got an 18-year-old granddaughter and she says, Papa, you're weird. I go, why? She goes, how many other granddaughters have to make an appointment to go and see their papa? And I said, yeah. Um, so she came around last week and she said, would you like a cup of tea? I said, oh, yeah, put the jug on. Would you like a ginger kiss? I said, oh, yeah, okay. And what about some ginger nuts? I said, oh, okay. And I thought, what's this all about? She goes, well, while you're drinking your cup of tea and you're having your ginger nut, I can ever talk to you. And she, she said to me, why don't people listen to the younger generation? And I think, I, I think she, she hit a spot with me. Um, <coughs> and so um, I've said to her that uh, uh, you should come to more of our wānanga. And she said, why don't you organise some wānanga for us young ones? And so that's, and, and you know, that 500 year plan that I talked about, the older generation didn't write that plan, it was the younger generation. Because it's now their plan and they're going to own it. And so, uh, yeah, we need to be prepared to listen and uh, be more inclusive of our younger generation. Yeah, Barney, my, my dad used to say it's all about family. Fano, my dad was a real strong family man. So whenever I'm sort of working through stuff and thinking about, you know, how I can be more sustainable or address this whole issue around climate change or whatever it is I'm doing in the built environment, I always think of my children. And I think if, every, if you all just think about your own kids and what you want for them, then the answers come pretty quickly and pretty clearly, I reckon. Yeah, so it's about keeping it simple. Just one other thing too um, that I wanted to touch on, Barney, and you might want to speak to this is, is a lack of follow through. So iwi mana whenua get pretty annoyed when they embark in an engagement process and then somewhere along the line that engagement process comes to a halt for whatever reason and it gets put on the shelf and then later on canned. So I've had a number of these situations now where we've started on this project and then Nick leaves and goes back to Australia, Barney. <laughs> and then you're stuck with this project and who's the next guy coming in? And then I'm getting phone calls from Nati Thomas saying, hey, we just spent all of this bloody time the last year negotiating and talking about this project only for it to get shelved. What are they up to there? So this is across the board with all organisations and, and territorial authorities. You must have a pathway to finish the project and make sure that you follow through when you embark in a, any kind of engagement process with mana whenua, iwi, hapu. So that's just one other parting shot. Sorry to be the bearer of bad news. Feels like I'm real cynic, but I'm not. I think there's a lot of good things going on, a lot of positive stuff, and, and you guys are doing a great job. So it's not all negative. It's just these are the things that we can see as pain points from a mana whenua, tangata whenua, iwi perspective. So. I guess as a landscape architects, and we all do, we can do so much. And I think we need to push our boundary more and more for not only for our profession, but also for many other things. And I feel that, of course, and all of you, I think we share the same feeling that we're so lucky to have this job. And I think I want to say that um, adaptation is not about we once again adapt nature, but it's the time that we adapt ourselves and can, how can design um, enhance that adaptation to our own humanity? Yes. Uh, I guess uh, to add to that uh, would just be, yeah, go beyond the physical boundaries of a site, um, really try to draw in uh, those kind of wider connections. Um, again, touching on like that whole social uh, concept and like the resilience attached to that, like, it's a huge one. Um, the landscape's not successful without its people. So um, I think, you know, we have a job as landscape architects to really um, create more than that physical outcome and think more about um, occupation um, and enduring presence of people and how they use that landscape. Um, when we think about 
programming and, um, you know, typical park stuff or waterfront stuff. Uh, we kind of need to push the boat. So, um, yeah, just open your mind, be ready to listen, pins down, um, and try to work with your, your local communities a bit more. But you guys are already doing that, but could could always be better, right? Um, yeah, kia ora. I was just going to think about what Barney said about listening. That's something that I've been reflecting on a lot over the last few years. I was at a hui on wastewater treatment um, recently, and there were quite a few people in the room, 15, 20 people, and um, the staff, council staff that were there wanted to know what the cultural values were in relation to a certain wastewater treatment plant. And the mana whenua present talked at great length about the values. They talked about um, being able to harvest, not being able to harvest kai, um, the sadness over what was happening to the water. Um, they talked about not being able to exercise manaakitanga at the marae. And they talked about what ha happened in their youth and, and their, their sense of sadness about what their children will experience. There was so many, there was so much beautiful stuff being said. And they talked for about 45 minutes and I was just sitting there going, wow, what a tonga the, these council people are getting about the values. And at the end, the, um, the staff said, uh, so shall we organise another hui to tell us the cultural values? And I was like, <laughs> and I th and I think what it was was that they were being told what manafino what manafino are valued, but they were expecting something else. They were expecting perhaps something more along the lines of what they thought cultural values were going to be. And um, but they were getting a really on the ground, you know lesson and what was valued at that place by those people and it really taught me a great lesson about listening to instead of just coming along with you know feeling a bit hoo-ha about this or that to actually listen to what other people were saying because it might not be it being expressed in a way that's um usual for me but to just sit back and really think because that was you know that was one of the great life lessons for me that that hui so i'll just leave you with that kia ora. Yeah, well, um, in, in terms of values, I suppose, um, you know, and, and a weird or a challenge to you all is, um, do, do you, you know, do you understand the views and the positions of iwi? And like, you know, Rose said, it, it, it's not a transactional thing sometimes. It really is based on a fundamental relationship. And I always like the example that Barney gives around, um, it's like a marriage, you know, you go on your first date, you might have a, um, you know, go for a drink and then you'll go out for dinner and then eventually you'll get into bed with them. But it's... Did I say that? <laughs> you know you said that, Bunny. But, you know, it's, it's got to start from the beginning and then, you know, your projects, whatever, will flourish with that trust. So when we're talking about design and, you know, there's, there'll be so much opportunity if you have a, um, your, a real strong relationship with the, with the iwi, and it's it's not like a, you know, oh, we'll get a, a report done and what have you. It's a long, enduring relationship. Um, so it might not meet the, the timelines or the deadlines or the funding applications or what have you. And, and the one thing about iwi is that we're here, we've been here for years, we're often, you know, talking about the same things year after year after year, um, but we're not going away, you know. This is, a, it's a long-term game for us. Um, so I think, how do you apply that into your um, your practice and your thinking of coming up with these solutions? And then I, I would say, yeah, te mano te taia, putting the taia first in terms of all of your um, kaupapa. Um, and that's, you know, te mano te is the same. We put the water first. And we're the tainer, we're the younger person. If you think about a whakapapa, um, we're, we're at the bottom. The natural world is, is our tuakana as the elder, so it's a, it's a different way of looking at the world, and I think if you can adapt that thinking, um, you watch what happens, and it'll be, yeah, so that's the challenge and the weddle to you all, it's, um, it's a journey, it's not going to happen overnight, but it will happen, got to start somewhere, and that's your own personal journey, whether it's learning um, who the iwi are, um, a little bit about te reo, a little bit about the history, all those things will help you to um, have the tools um, to engage 
um, or come up with something really choice. So yeah, Gilda. Namihi nui kia koutou. Thank you very much for all of your um, comments and challenges, the widow. Um, and please join me in thanking our panel. <laughs>